already and uh, you know we'll continue of course so so my talk is about uh, people that are in some weird places underground mining for dark stuff right so uh, sometimes what can happen in colloquias is that you listen to that and then well here probably you don't look out of the window but maybe you know there's this me message coming in your smartphone and 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 by the time you come back you you lost track if that happens to you do not despair uh, simply wait till you see one of those guys there and uh, that's your sign, your opportunity to come back in the talk. I'll have like some, rarely a lot of those self-contained uh, chapters. And so if you zone out, that's fine. Uh, just wait for this. Um, so here's my overview slide. And uh, I would say we'll start from, uh, with the first one right away, um, where uh, the take home message of what is to come is that from cosmology, we have evidence that dark matter exists at all time scales, uh, cosmologically speaking. The first evidence comes from Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Um, three minutes after the Big Bang, top uh, right, shows you a little bit what the scale, time, and length scales are that we are looking at. And the point there is just that, you know, uh, you, you form uh, protons and neutrons. Uh, you, you have formed those and you uh, build a nuclei. Most of the stuff goes into uh, helium. Uh, but then you look at higher order effects and uh, in particular look at deuterium. And what you would predict is the denser this primordial soup is, the more deuterium can fuse into helium and is lost. So the higher the density, the deuterium abundance goes down. And then you ask your astronomy friends to measure the earliest deuterium abundance that they can. And they find that you know, this agrees for a density in this uh, cosmological units, capital omega, where all the omegas need to add up to one in our universe, um, where you find that the density of baryons is around 5%. And so what we learn here about dark matter, um, for all the evidences that I show you, I also want to show you what we get out of that. What we learn here is that dark matter is something new. We are not talking about atoms. We are not talking about uh, just you know, cold stuff that doesn't shine. But we are really talking about some, something that is made of something completely else, not made out of baryons. Let's fast forward to 370,000 years after Big Bang when the cosmic microwave background radiation was emitted. You know the pretty picture. Um, if you want to do a Fourier spectrum or in 2D, it would be called a power spectrum, a deconvolution to spherical harmonics. This is a spectrum that you get. And of course, you look at that by eye and you say, oh, this looks like a damped oscillator. That's exactly what this is. Uh, um, you have uh, baryon acoustic oscillations that are happening. But then, uh, you know, we're all physicists in here, so we look and we're like, well, something's weird about this curve. Um, it's not just damped, but this third peak is too high. Um, and what this tells you right away is just looking at it by eye, you can see that there needs to be some component in this early universe that are, does not participate in the damping. The damping comes from photon pressure. And so what you learn is two things. You make a measurement, a, a quantitative analysis. The first thing is that you learn that there is a component called dark matter that is uh, five times more than normal matter that does interact with photons. And the other thing that you learn is dark matter is, has no electromagnetic interaction to the precision of this measurement. It doesn't interact with photons. So really, dark matter is a historic misnomer. It should be called transparent matter. But then, of course, dark matter sounds so much cooler, right? So we stick with the name. So that's the cosmic microwave background radiation. The point here is that those density fluctuations that you observe are at the level of 10 to the minus 4. They're really, really tiny. But if you look at the density fluctuations that we observe in the universe today, they are huge, right? Here we're sitting on Earth. And if you just go 100 miles up, then we're in the outer vacuum of space, uh, vacuum of outer space. And so how do you get um, those huge density fluctuations from those tiny density fluctuations in the incredibly short time of only 14 billion years? Um, that was a little bit of a joke, but OK, anyway. Um, uh, well, the answer is what you need is you need a lot of gravity. And in fact, you need much more gravity than uh, the baryons would give you. You need a lot of dark matter again to do that. This is the science of structure formation. Uh, we can uh, replicate the universe in uh, the computer and uh, uh, explain um, the clumping, the clustering that we see. Again, we have evidence that we need a lot of dark matter. In this case, you would say it's like something like the integral, right? You take in, in time um, where you have evidence for dark matter. What we learn from structure, structure formation about dark matter is that it needs to be non-relativistic. If dark matter were relativistic, it would move very quickly. It would tend to smear out uh, structure. But that's, that's the, the opposite of what we need. That's the opposite of effect of what is observed. Uh, what we need is we need dark matter that wants to cluster, that wants to clump. And so we learn here that dark matter is non-relativistic. The technical term is called cold, right? But really what this means is dark matter has to be non-relativistic. And there we are. If I lost you already, or for all those that are coming in a little bit later, welcome. Just wait for those guys, and you haven't missed anything. Um, 
And we go on to the next uh, piece of evidence, which is from astrophysics. What kind of astrophysical evidence do we have uh, for dark matter? And what we'll find here is that we see evidence for dark matter at all length scales. So let me start at the very biggest cosmology we talked already. Uh, next smaller scale is clusters of galaxies, the largest objects in the universe, bound objects in the universe that we see. And uh, for example, here's a picture of the Coma cluster. Every blue smudge here is a galaxy that is part of that cluster. You can look at it in any wavelength you want, and you see 10 to the 14 solar masses in this cluster. You can also look at how fast this stuff is moving just from Doppler effect, and you find that in order to sustain those large velocities that you observe, you need a rather steep gravitational potential well, uh, such that the cluster wouldn't explode. Uh, more technically, I mean, you could do that with the escape velocity, but actually you can do it with the entire uh, uh, um, velocity distribution. That's called the virial theorem. Um, you find that your gravitational potential well needs to be at least 10 to the 15 solar masses deep to sustain those high velocities that you observe. And so you see in gal uh, gravitation in galaxy clusters that we have evidence that there needs to be a lot more dark matter than meets the eye as well. You can do the same thing with gravitational lensing. Here's Abel 2218. Uh, and what you find is that you see very much stronger uh, curving of gravitational lenses than what you would expect based on the observed mass. So this gives you a consistent picture. Uh, there is one rather fun thing uh, about clusters. So, so what we learn is that in, in clusters of galaxies, there too, dark matter really dominates what's going on. Uh, we can look at merging clusters. This example you may have heard of already or maybe not. Um, this one is the so-called bullet cluster. Really, this picture is uh, two clusters of galaxies. One is here. There's a bit more galaxies here, which you may be able to see. There's a smaller cluster here. Um, your astronomy friends here will tell you that most of the baryonic mass, most of the normal matter in galaxy clusters is actually in the form of uh, hot intracluster gas that shines in x-rays due to the depth of the gravitational well. So let's uh, take a picture of the Chandra satellite, and now you know also why we know that these are two clusters, because you see the two blobs here. And uh, you know why this thing is called the bullet cluster, right? You see the shock front here. What happened is that sometime in the past, a few hundred million years ago, those two clusters went right through each other, and the gas got shocked. This is where most of the baryonic mass is. Now, what can I do? So I can look at background galaxies and gravitational microlensing of those background uh, uh, galaxies, and I can make a map of how the gravity is distributed in this cluster and uh, look at where is most of the mass actually. And what you find is that most of the mass here in those contour lines is actually offset from where most of the baryonic mass is. So the sketch um, that I have here for you is, well, by now we are no longer surprised. We know that there's really three components in this cluster. There's galaxies. There's about 10 times more mass in gas. Um, but then there's another 10 times more or so uh, mass in dark matter. And as time goes by, these two clusters go through each other. The gas, most of the baryonic mass, is shocked and is left behind, whereas the um, dark matter and the galaxies, they just pass right through. The galaxies do that because on those scales, they're essentially point particles that are far, few and far in between, so they don't scatter. Um, but dark matter apparently also does the same thing. It doesn't seem to scatter. And so you can derive a limit here on the cross-section for dark matter, dark matter interactions per unit mass of you know, some number that you get out of here. And so what we learn from this observation is that dark matter doesn't like to interact a whole lot. Any interactions that we can expect are, are at most somewhat weak. Um, you can also learn from here that uh, modifications of gravity won't do the trick. But anyway. Um, zooming in further in, we can look at rotation curves of galaxies. So we're at a scales of 10 to the 4 light years. Here's uh, one from our local uh, uh, group. That's just because I can found a pretty picture. We could make a nice pretty picture mosaic of here. And what you can look at is as a function of distance, how fast does this galaxy rotate, right? You know galaxies rotate, right? Um, and so here's the, the plot. What would you expect? Well, you know, this is non-relativistic Newtonian, uh, Newtonian dynamics. This is easy physics 101. Uh, centripetal force equals gravitational force. Uh, you solve that for the rotational velocities. You find the square root gm, uh, the mass distribution over r. But then you also know uh, for gravitational uh, potentials um, outside the mass distribution, you can assume the distribution is just a point mass at the origin. So you know, just you would say m of r is really not a function of r, it's just a point mass. So you, this just becomes m, and the rotational velocity that you would expect is just one over the square root of radius, which is exactly Kepler's law. Um, that's that's hand waving. I do a lot of hand waving here. So if you're working on any of those topics, my apologies for not uh, maybe doing due to justice to how complicated those things can be. What you see here as the curve is kind of 1 over square root r, except this curve 
takes the actual distribution into account, so it's a little bit different. Anyway, um, I can then look at the Doppler shift, and I can see how fast does this galaxy actually rotate, and what you find is what is called a flat rotation curve. Um, the rotational velocities are much faster than what you think you can sustain based on the mass that is there. Um, this galaxy would need to explode, but clearly it doesn't. Um, this is not unique to this particular galaxy. This is essentially true for any galaxy you look at, and it's uh, the, the, well, problem or whatever. Uh, you call it an observation of flat rotation curves of galaxies. And I can ask, well, you know, we're not surprised about that anymore because we know there's dark matter by now. But I can ask what I can I learn about dark matter from that. And I can say, well, so what I need is I need this rotation of velocity to be constant. So that means my mass distribution roughly needs to go like proportional to the radius. And if you ever did astronomy 101, then you know the first model that you make of the sun is a self-gravitating blob of gas that has the same temperature everywhere. It's called an isothermal halo. Um, and you calculate there that an isothermal halo has a mass profile that just grows like the radius. If you plug that in, indeed you find that the rotational velocity that you would expect is flat, which is what you observe. So what you learn about dark matter from this observation is that dark matter is roughly distributed in an isothermal halo, meaning a, a, a roughly spherical blob which has roughly the same temperature everywhere. Um, we can do the same thing with our very own Milky Way. Here it is, um, the rotation curve of our Milky Way. We are out here at uh, eight and a half uh, kiloparsec from the center. That too is flat, cannot be explained by the stars and the gas that we observe. You need an additional component of dark matter and you can fit this and you find that there's evidence for dark matter right where we are uh, with a density that you can measure of 0.3 GeV per cubic centimeter. And if you're a condensed matter physicist, um, just uh, I'm using giga electron volts all the time through this talk, so please remember a proton mass is about one GeV. Okay, so that's the scale I want. Proton is one GeV, and we have a density of 0.3 GeV per cubic centimeter. That's, of course, locally that appears little, but remember that this is integrated over the entire galaxy, makes up actually a whole lot. So what do we learn about that is that dark matter is right here, and for what I'm doing, uh, of course, most importantly, we can actually search for dark matter, astrophysical dark matter, right here with a lab experiment that, um, that that's what I do. Okay, so here we go. Um, welcome back. Uh, now that we have all this evidence, um, I, I, we, the question is, what, what, what next? Right? So we would say we have evidence at vast time scales, cosmological time scales, and at all length scales in the entire universe. And so physically speaking, then the question becomes, what's the quantum of the dark matter field? That's a particle physics question. Um, and I can say, you know, um, in particle physics, the way we go about it is we study interactions. We never really look at the particles, but we look at how do those dark matter particles interact with other particles in the standard model that we know. It's a very active field of research, as you can imagine, given the body of, uh, uh, of evidence for dark matter. Um, you can look at that for, you know, in colliders, you can try to uh, go about the interactions with gluons, the Higgs. You can look for indirect searches where you look for does dark matter coupled to neutrinos, or in my case, you can just ask does dark matter coupled to normal stuff, protons, neutrons, uh, electrons. Um, what I would invite you um, to think about, uh, of course, uh, um, you can also ask the question, you know, how does dark matter interact with other dark matter, and you have the leading person, world expert on that, right, sitting right here in the front row. Hypo is, of course, the expert on that, so I'm not talking about that because that's scary, because he knows much more about that than I do. What I would like you to invite, though, is to not think of dark matter uh, no, there's not a piece of hair. It's a piece of hair on this, on this uh, monitor. Wow, that's confusing. Okay, there's another one here. This is really weird stuff. I was going to, to wish this away, but it doesn't work. Okay, anyway, so what I would like to invite you to think of dark matter is not necessarily as just this one particle, but maybe more like a collection of many particles, right? I mean, there's five times more dark matter in the universe than normal stuff, and think about all those standard model particles that you need to explain just this fifth. So it's, I think, very natural to think that, to expect that, uh, dark matter could be a very rich dark sector, um, but you know, truth be told, there's not really a whole lot of evidence, except of course for self-interacting dark matter, where there's actually a lot of evidence for, but I'm not talking about that. Um, why am I not talking about it? Why am I ignoring this for the rest of my talk? It's because to first order, you would expect that whatever experiment you make, there's one interaction channel that uh, dominates your, your, your signal, your experiment. Um, and so I, I just go back and I say, look, I'm looking for this one interaction channel that dominates my experiment. This is, this is equivalent of saying all the baryons in the universe is just hydrogen, right? And, uh, and there's no planets and no stars and no that. You, you kind of get it right, right? You, you have all the main features. 
That was another joke. Man, you guys are hard. Uh, OK, anyway, so, so what's the most important property of particles is arguably the mass. So what do we really know about the particle uh, this mass, dark matter mass? Um, we actually know that dark matter has uh, to be in this scale, which only spans some mere 90 orders of magnitude. Um, we know that dark matter has to be heavier than 10 to the minus 21 electron volts, because otherwise the, the, the Broglie wavelength of those particles would be so big that it would be larger than the size of dwarf galaxies. And we see dwarf galaxies contain dark matter, so the dark matter wouldn't fit into galaxies anymore. So we know it has to be heavier than that, that's for sure. Um, people, astronomers, looked for uh, gravitational lensing from dark matter, and uh, they ruled out any dark matter that is uh, where the quantum is heavier than 10 or so solar masses. So we also know for a fact that dark matter has to be lighter than 10 solar masses. Um, and in between, we only have 90 orders of magnitude to look for. So that's easy, right? Let, let's build one experiment to do that. <laughs> not happening. Um, so let's build a experiment that does something. Even that's not happening. What you need to, to make any progress now is you need to have an idea. You need to have a model. Ideally, a scientific model which is falsifiable. Otherwise, Popper claps you on the, claps you on the hand, on the wrist, if you don't do that. And so here's a series of models that cover, not surprisingly, more or less the entire mass space. Um, and I cannot talk about all of them. I'll pick some that I find most exciting. In particular, the one you probably have heard of is weakly interacting massive particles, with it, where the W is a capital W, a weak force interaction. Uh, that spans like GeV to TeV range, meaning masses of where one particle has the mass of an entire atom. Uh, WIMPs are a subgroup of thermal relic particles. They are, I'll talk about them more generally. Um, they are a fantastic model because they are very predictive, as I will show you. Um, important here for given that I know where I am, self-interacting dark matter spans a somewhat lower mass range is one of the best motivated, I would say, other um, uh, particle physics models. WIMPs, axions, self-interacting dark, dark matter probably doesn't get much better. But there's other names as well, hidden photons, sterile neutrinos, primordial black holes, if you really must. Um, OK, uh, so uh, for about those thermal relics, what's a thermal relic is important. It's one of the leading models for dark matter. Um, and so let me explain to you what a thermal relic is. Let's go to the early universe. Um, just in the Big Bang, we have this hot plasma. Uh, particles constantly annihilate and get produced and annihilate again. And so what I want to look at is I want to look at the density of thermal relic particles uh, in the early universe. So the only assumption, the very single only assumption I make about dark matter is I say, in the early universe, it was in thermal equilibrium with the rest of the universe. That's actually very natural because uh, all standard model particles uh, satisfy that, right? Protons, neutrons, that's exactly how they were made. If that's the case, then uh, I can look at the density that is plotted here as a function of time. Uh, and this density is just a constant because those dark matter particles constantly annihilate into standard model particles and lighter standard model particles constantly produce those heavier dark matter particles. Um, the universe is expanding. I don't want to deal with that, so I just divide the expansion of the universe out of my density units. That's called co-moving coordinates. Um, so, so, you know, it's just constant, okay? So all that happens really uh, in those units is the universe cools. And so at some point, what will happen is that those lighter standard model particles will no longer have enough energy to produce those heavier dark matter particles. Those still annihilate those, so the density of those particle drops. This is just really what I'm doing is just Boltzmann equation in the early universe where I conveniently divided the expansion out. So um, the, the density drops is called Boltzmann suppression. If that were the case, then I wouldn't have any dark matter left today. Luckily, that's not the case, because at some point what will happen is that the density of dark matter becomes so sparse that those thermal relics will not meet each other anymore to annihilate. And so if that's the case, then I freeze out, that's a technical term, um, I'm, I leave this Boltzmann suppression curve and I'm stuck with a, a constant density in those co-moving units of a constant relic density of dark matter. This is completely independent of particle physics. It's just Boltzmann equation in the early universe. Crucially, if the cross-section, meaning the probability for annihilation of dark matter, is higher, then I can, can, can continue to annihilate for a longer time. I follow this curve longer, so as the cross-section, thermally averaged annihilation cross-section goes, becomes higher, my relic density drops. And so from nothing, this has nothing to do with particle physics, just from the assumption that uh, dark matter is a thermal relic particle, I get a, a, a prediction for the density, again, in those funny density units that all have to add up for to one, um, which is like 10 to the minus 26 weird units over the thermally averaged cross-section. And now you can say, OK, what do I plug in for as a number? If you say you know, non-relativistic speeds and cross-sections that are typically for the weak, capital weak scale, 
then that would be a WIMP particle. And uh, miraculously, if you plug that in, you get up about, you know, uh, omega about 0.2, 20%, which is roughly what we observe. Um, I don't want to dwell on that, but instead I want to point something out which is very important for what I do. That's the direct detection. And that is to say that um, I can look at the rate in my detector. Um, and what you get, this is just a dimensional argument, so don't beat me up for it. Um, uh, you get actually a very uh, robust scattering prediction. The rate in a detector that you put here on Earth will be the cross-section of the process times the flux of those particles where the flux of those particles is just the velocity of the particles times the density of the particles. But I just told you, dimensional argument, that the density of the particles goes like 1 over sigma v, thermally averaged, and this is the annihilation cross-section, this one is a scattering cross-section. Yeah, I know, dimensional argument. So this just goes like sigma v over sigma v gives me a constant. And so for thermal relic particles, it's a fantastic target that I can rule out because I know the interaction rate in my detector where constant, in this case, approximately constant means to, you know, within four or five orders of magnitude. Right. So that's really good. I have something very, very concrete that I can go and hunt after. Another thing that is really nice is that we know that those uh, two Feynman graphs exist, right? The production and annihilation uh, mechanism that's by the assumption of what a thermal relic does. And you can search for this graph at colliders. You can search for this one at indirect searches. But because of crossing symmetry, you know Fermi gra graphs, you can rotate whichever way you like. You know that for thermal, thermal relic particles, this graph must exist. And what is that? That is just scattering. So what, for, you know, it's also called the make it, break it, and shake it approach to uh, finding thermal relic particles. Um, in my case, this is really cool because it tells you, you have to be able um, to, to see those particles. If they exist, you will be able to build an experiment just generically until some theorist comes up and, you know, wiggles out some loop or whatever, invents some crazy green man that, that make that go away. But just generically, you are able to, uh, to search for those experiments. Uh, search for those particles for experiments. Okay, so this was all I want you to know about thermal relics. Great target to look for. The question then is, if you set out to detect thermal relic particles, um, what's, what's the underlying physics? What kind of detector do you need to build? Okay, so again, just again in this little bit hand-waving way that I'm shaking here right back of the envelope physics, um, what's, the, what's, the, what's the underlying equations? And the first thing to realize is this is really simple, non-relativistic, physics 101, Newtonian pool billiard ball scattering mechanics. Um, so what do you expect? First of all, the rate that you would expect is less than a few events per year per ton of target material. How do I know that? Because we looked already and we didn't find anything. Oops, spoiler alert. Um, so so that's, your, that's your rate here. Um, well, let's, let's look at something. There's, there's this thing about De Broglie wavelengths, right? Let's look at the De Broglie wavelength of a WIMP particle. Technically, it's the De Broglie wavelength of the transferred momentum, but who cares? So if I just calculate the De Broglie wavelength of my WIMP particle, h bar over p, you can do that in the head, h bar c over mc squared, I just put a few c's in there because I know h bar c by heart, that's 200 MeV femtometers. This all cancel, 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 all that's left is femtometers, which is the size of the nucleus. Meaning my dark matter particle has a, a wavelength that is of the order of the size of the nucleus. It will not be able to resolve individual protons and re neutrons in the nucleus. The wavelength is too large. So it cannot scatter uh, with individual protons and neutrons. Instead, what happens is that the scattering needs to go, uh, you know, what you do, how do you do that? Quantum mechanics, right? You get coherent enhancement. You first take all the scattering amplitudes with all your A, A is the mass number of your nucleus, with all your A nuclei, protons and neutrons, and then you first sum them up and then you square them. So you get a coherent enhancement that goes like I squared, which explains why we're using, one of the reasons why we're using liquid xenon. Because xenon is at the bottom right of the periodic table. It's very heavy. It gives you a very large enhancement by A squared. And technical detail, if you don't want to couple to the mass number, but if you want to couple to the spin, then you go like the square of the, the quantum mechanical square of the spin. But same, same idea, you, you coherently scatter. Okay, that's really good. So what kind of detector do I need to build? What kind of energies am I looking at? Um, unfortunately, looking at very low energies. Let's just calculate the maximum uh, transferred uh, m m maximum recoil energy that I can get, just p squared over 2m. You plug in, you know, whatever your favorite wind mass is, it's non-relativistic, whatever your target is like 50 kV, ouch. Okay, that's small energies. We're not talking about deep inelastic scattering at the LHC at, at hundreds of MeV or GeV, but we're talking about kilo electron volts, very low energies. And to make it worse, what's the distribution that you will get? We will not have a very nice line where I could have my, you know, backgrounds estimated from left and right from the shoulders but you're just averaging over all scattering angles that you can get, so really your recall spectrum is just a simple falling exponential. So it's technically very challenging to build those kinds of experiments. You need to be big, and you need to have very low energy um, sensitivity. 
how then would you want to present your results? Well, um, what's the two parameters that I'm interested in? One is the mass. I don't know the mass. Um, and the other one is uh, I want to know the, the, the interaction probability, right, the cross-section. And so really I have no clue about any of those two numbers, so let's make a log-log plot, uh, which is exactly what we do here, log-log plot. And then um, you can take your favorite particle physics model and you can put it on this plot. Now I have to mention here a little bit something. This one is uh, from 2000 or something. It's, uh, I think it's NMSSM uh, model. It doesn't really matter what you put on here. You can use a Higgs portal model or you can use, you go to a box diagram to couple to the Z boson, whatever you want to do. As I promised to you, within some a few, few four or five orders of magnitude, you have a constant prediction of where you land, okay? This is fantastic because this is a target that you can aim at and you can shoot it down. How good are we at doing this? This is shown here. Um, uh, there's actually three experiments. They all work essentially colloquium level exactly the same way. Seminar level, kind of the same way. Second year grad student, kind of the same way. Uh, once you are in my group for one and a half or two years, then you start realizing the differences. So what I'm saying is there's different experiments, but they all work, they all are seen on time projection chambers. And they say dark matter interacts less likely than this line. And this is a non-trivial statement, because what I'm showing you here is that the detectors that we have right now are probing the cosmo cosmologically, astrophysically, and uh, particle physics-wise uh, interesting models. This is a very non-trivial statement. We're not having a fishing expedition completely in the dark, but we are where we need to be. Um, why can I afford to not show you the individual curves, but just put one for all three of them? Is because we're just doing non-relativistic scattering mechanics. So really, um, the curve is essentially the same for everyone at low masses. You fight the threshold at some point, you know, if you have a very light dark matter particle, it cannot transfer sufficient momentum to this big, fat, heavy xenon nucleus, and so you lose out against your energy threshold. And at, low, at, at high masses, what happens there as well, you know, from astrophysics, I keep my local mass density fixed, 2.3 GeV per cubic centimeter. But then from particle physics, I would now say, you know, as your mass becomes more heavy of the individual particle, your number density goes down linearly. And so your scattering rate goes down linearly, and so your sensitivity loses out linearly. So this is just really just one over mass there. It's the same very universally, right? You're just sitting, kinematics don't change anymore. You're just sitting on the reduced mass. I'm doing physics 101, right? So even I can do that. That's really cool. Okay, um, so that's where we are. So, uh, okay, I'm halfway in my talk. It's time for some pictures. Let's take a break. Um, my xenon uh, detector is at the Gran Sasso uh, lab that's uh, in Italy, so let's hop in the airplane. Google, as of this morning, gets you there in 19 and a quarter hours for $3,000. That's outrageous. Um, <laughs> but OK. Um, anyway, you fly over there. Um, then you hop in a car and from Rome Airport. You drive to uh, the Abruzzo mountain range. It's actually quite pretty there. Um, on your way there, you come to, uh, well, the Gran Sasso mountain range. You see the Corno Grande here. There's a highway tunnel. You drive into the highway tunnel. This is actually a very long highway tunnel. This one is 10 kilometers long. So you're driving in your highway tunnel. 10 kilometers, right? Takes a while. You're driving, you're driving, you're driving. Then you're in the middle of the mountain, and there's an exit. And so you take that exit in the middle of the mountain, and then you enjoy looking at the highway where all the tourists drive by and go, like, what's going on there? And you're standing in front of this gate, and there's a little button, and you push the little button, you say the magic words, and then uh, in my head, always James Bond music, da 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 da, plays because then the gate opens, and you drive in what is the largest underground laboratory in the world. This is a picture of what the first thing that you will see. A little bit of maze of, uh, of tunnels. My main point being this is we have three large experimental halls there. Uh, some of the experiments, other experiments that are there that you may have heard of is the Borixino experiment. Opera, that's the guys with the faster than light neutrinos. Uh, Gerda, uh, and, and a series of other experiments. Um, here, for size comparison, you have a couple of people down here. This is in one of those big halls. You see the ceiling up there. Uh, we build a three-story building just to house all the infrastructure that we need for our experiment next to the water tank. Why do we underground? Sorry, I didn't even say. Why do we go underground? It's, of course, to shield cosmic radiation, which is a background, right? We, we, again, we, we, look for, we, we look for a few events in a huge detector. This detector down there, um, it, if you just put it underground, that's good. That gets your trigger rate down, but it's not good enough. So we need to put it in a 10 meter by 10 meter tall water tank. One of the grad students in my group, he actually uh, rendered a poster. It looks a bit weird, but if you stand there, it's really cool because it looks like it, it shows what it would look like if you could look inside, which is why this roof there is so point. So the detector sits inside. Here's a picture of the detector during construction. It's really just a meter by a meter. Uh, it's a, um, a cryostat. What you see here is the, the copper field shaping rings. 
lots of Teflon. At the, both at the bottom and the top, we have uh, uh, photomultiplier arrays with three inch PMTs. All this stuff is super low background. Um, every, every nut and bolt is actually handmade in our machine made in our machine shops from custom selected materials to get the radioactivity down to the levels that we need. Um, anyway, you, you close that thing up, you wrap it up, and then you fill the water tank. Um, we put a GoPro camera uh, on one of the calibration belts uh, so you, you um, of what it looks like if you fill down there. Now, blob, we go in the water chunk. That's the refractive index. But anyway, so now you're next to the water tank. Um, OK, good. So, so much for pictures. How the heck does this experiment work? Um, so let me explain to you liquid xenon TPCs. And the point there is that these are really leading and versatile detectors. You cannot just do dark matter, as I will show you um, with those experiments, but you can do a lot more. And I think you can ask, you know, why are they so good and why are they leading? And I think the key point is that these detectors can extract redundant event information on an event by event basis at energies of less than 10 kilo electron volts per event. And because of that redundant information, heck, these are prototypes, right? They do all kinds of quirky things. I mean, just imagine you build a, put a detector together in the garage, right? Um, and so because you have redundant information, you can get rid of the quirks that you don't want. Anyway, so what you do is you have a cryostat, you fill it up with liquid pot of water, pot, pot of, uh, well, a bucket. You fill it up with liquid xenon, photomultipliers in the top and on the bottom. Any particle comes. Let's suppose it interacts. It scatters, right? It kicks the, it kicks the uh, nucleus or an electron, uh, whatever. And um, you generate from that uh, recoil, you generate a prompt scintillation light. So we are very inventive. Imagine if people, the first light that we see, we call that signal, the first signal that we see, we call it the S1 signal. It's a prompt scintillation light signal that we pick up by the PMTs. But then we are also very mean. We put an electric field, and we're drifting those elect some of those electrons to the top. So for a while, we don't see anything. That's the drift time. Um, the detector is rather slow. We only drift a millimeter per microsecond, and the detector is a meter across. So, you know, drift times up to a millisecond. Um, uh, but the cool thing here is now, from this time, I know the depth of the interaction. Up there, I have a second electric field, an extraction field, and then I push the uh, electrons through the gas. And I, like, you know, Geiger counter is exponential amplification. Gives you a click. We tune the high voltage a bit further down, so we get proportional scintillation. And we get a second signal, and so we call that second signal, again, very inventive, the S2 signal. Because that second signal happens close to the top PMT array, you can do a pattern recognition on the top PMT array to say, to say in X, Y, where did your event happen? This is just to say, this PMT is yellow, so that's where the event happened. This one is black, this didn't see any light, that's not where the event happened. Um, and so this is, uh, this is how a signal looks like. The main feature here is that um, we have uh, redundant, uh, this redundant information allows us to um, Sorry, pardon me, the, the position reconstruction that we have allows us to fiducialize our detector. Most of the radioactive backgrounds come from the outside, and we reduce the backgrounds on, in the center of the detector with the exponent um, of the, the diameter of the detector, which is why this background really drops by many, many orders of magnitude by cutting out this. This is not the only uh, way that we can discriminate signal from background. Background on the surface, signal dark matter would be everywhere in the detector. But we can do a little bit more. I can look at the S1 and the S2 signals. It's both shown here on. Um, scale, so ionization this way, scintillation this way. The brighter the event, the more energy was deposited. I can uh, put a calibration source uh, in the detector. Actually, this particular one is a Purdue invention. Um, we were thinking about uh, how to calibrate those big detectors. You can't just stick a gamma source on the outside anymore. Compton's don't make it in, which is, of course, exactly the feature that you want, right? You, you, they don't make it into fiducial volume. Um, but so we were scratching our heads how we could calibrate it anyway. So we came up with this idea to. Uh, deliberately screw up your super pure liquid xenon target with another radioactive noble gas. Took a bit of convincing that we would be allowed to do that, to deliberately screw up your target. But uh, you know we could show that it um, decays all the way. So anyway, what you get is typical background events, beta, gamma background events. They cluster here, this electronic recoils along the yellow line. You can do the same thing with a uh, nuclear uh, recoil source, neutron source, for example, from amateur beryllium or neutron generator, and you see nuclear recoils, which is mostly what your dark matter would do, right? Kick the xenon nucleus, um, cluster along the blue line. And that's great because now you have a an additional discrimination between electron and uh, between signal and background. So you take all the calibration sources out and you just take data, you twiddle your thumbs for a month, and this, this is what you get. Um, you get a few events that cluster along the yellow line, nothing along the blue line. Darn, we didn't find any dark matter. So what you do is you place a limit. In particular, we can place limits on WIMPs, uh, both for spin-independent and spin-dependent interactions. We can look for more uh, interesting things in elastic dark matter effective field theories. We can look for self-interacting dark matter, boosted dark matter was mentioned, um, or uh, lighter dark matter we can push down to GeV. 
a more recent development is the realization that our background is so low that even the background uh, can be used to extract useful information, and actually quite a lot of that. You can look for leptophilic or axial vector WIMPs that would scatter off the electrons. You would see them up there. Uh, luminous mi uh, mirror dark matter, inelastic scattering, axion-like particles, dark photons, super WIMPs, uh, solar axions, sterile neutrinos would all show up there, or double electron capture on neutrinos. And if this doesn't ring a bell to you, solid state physicists, sorry, just ignore it. Bottom line is there's a lot of signals. This is a list of signals, and I have a slide for each of those if you have a question about that. Don't you dare. Um, the, the point being, these, are very ver this, these liquid xenon detectors are very versatile detectors. Right? It's not just a WIMP search, but we can actually do a lot more from dark matter physics, astrophysics, nuclear physics, particle physics, or just general detector uh, physics. OK, so what's the status um, of these searches? Uh, results are imminent. Uh, when we scheduled the, this talk, I was going, yeah, let's do it as late as possible. And this was the latest one you had for me, because then maybe I could show you new results. And, um, uh, it's actually really exciting because as of today, we have uh, an order of magnitude more life days on tape. You saw we, we took data the entire last year, this yellow curve going up. Uh, very stable operation, very no frills, very unexciting. Um, so that's really cool. This is what the data looks like at low energies, but there is still this blinded region on my plot here. Um, we actually unblinded this last Monday. So I know what's in there, but I, I can't show you. Even if I could, uh, in addition to being blinded, just to protect ourselves from bias, we additionally also salted the events, meaning we introduced artificial salt events to, again, prevent bias. Now, I was the one to put that in, so, so I know what that is in there as well, but I can't tell you that. We are going to un unsalt desalinate, as we say, uh, next week um, by the current schedule, and so we should have the results out shortly afterwards. Uh, I, hope, uh, I hope we'll have the results for you from the search uh, published uh, th this month still, so, so stay tuned for that. OK, so very near future, what we should be able to, we should be able to lower this limit and probe another factor of five or so of this, what I would call, best motivated dark matter model. Beyond that, um, we are working on an upgrade, which we call Xenon Anton. This is just because we were moving crazy fast on this. And when we needed to write the proposals, we didn't know how big we made it. And so we just called, oh, whatever, N Anton. And we were wanted to replace it. But then somebody submitted the proposal without replacing N. So now it's called uh, Xenon Anton. It's actually eight <laughs> tons total. Uh, Six tons active. The key here is that um, most of the systems are built that they can already accommodate, in particular, for example, the cryostat, the cryogenics. We don't need to touch anything. So it's really just a quick upgrade of the innermost TPC. Xenon is in hand. PMTs are tested. Um, so we'll, we'll build this thing together. We put this thing together this year, uh, data taking next year of this experiment, which will allow us to go down by another order of magnitude or so beyond what I'm going to show you this month. Um, uh, disclaimer, there's the competitor experiment, LZ, uh, mostly in the United States, uh, which does exactly the same thing. Uh, they are building it uh, new from scratch. Uh, so it's actually a great fun uh, environment to be in. Uh, you know, in competition, it's just so much more fun. It actually really makes a very, pro very professional field um, and some very fun referee comments. Um, OK, so uh, good. Um, what, what do we do with that? Uh, wait, how am I time? Um, uh, it's not just dark matter. Because these experiments are now getting so uh, big, well, I'm actually very good in time. Um, because these experiments are getting so big, uh, we are finding new channels are becoming important. And one of those is uh, coherent neutrino scattering. This was just discovered last, uh, last uh, fall uh, with a reactor neutrino source. And what I'm, here to stand, what I'm standing here to tell you is that this experiment is a neutrino experiment. At which point you should say, Rafael, you're crazy. There's no way your tiny, tiny little xenon detector can be a neutrino experiment. Because we know extreme neutrino experiments. Boric xenon is 280 tons. And you can walk around in it. With a super K, you can take a paddle boat and boat around, row around it. Or super K, you can ski on that entire thing. Right? And you're telling me your tiny detector is a neutrino detector. Yes, it is. Because I go down to low energies, I can actually exploit an effect that happens with neutrinos, which is just coherent scattering, the same thing we know already from dark matter, at which point my cross-section goes like A squared. So my two-ton liquid xenon detector is actually equivalent to a 200-ton neutrino detector. And so suddenly, I'm, talk I'm, 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 in, I'm, I'm in business. Um, one of the first signals that we'll, we will see um, from that, we, again, spoiler alert, we haven't seen anything yet. But uh, one of the first signals, this plot comes from the LZ collaboration, is a signal from solar boron eight neutrinos coherently scattering on the neutrino, oh, sorry, on the xenon nuclei, which will sit at very, very lowest energies. Um, so that is, uh, now it depends how you look at that. The way I'm looking at it is actually it's quite exciting because 
it allows us to measure the, for example, the solar metallicity. But of course, there's another way to look at it, and that is now you have a source of nuclear recoils that is a background to your dark matter search. Why is it a background? Well, we're just doing, again, simple scattering uh, kinematics. So, you know, simple scattering kinematics means it's degenerate in the momentum that is transferred. So I cannot distinguish with, with just one target, with just one detector, I cannot distinguish between a heavy WIMP that is slow and a light neutrino that is fast. As long as the transferred momentum is the same, they will look identical. And what that means is I can put uh, signals from solar neutrinos or from neutrinos on the same plot, like, like dark matter, right? Which is where, what, where this is coming from. Um, you see with xenon one ton or, or n-ton, depending on how it goes with one ton, probably not with n-ton, probably for sure. We, will be, we should be able to see the signal from boron-8 neutrinos. Uh, there's another background here, which is often called a neutrino floor, and I hate the name because it's not a floor, you couldn't stand on it, um, is uh, another coherent neutrino signal from atmospheric neutrinos. Um, another channel that I'm excited about is that we realized that those detectors, right now, already the one that is running, is actually a supernova neutrino detector with a flavor-independent channel. It's the only flavor-independent uh, neutrino, uh, supernova neutrino detector with a sensitivity here for xenon one ton across the entire Milky Way at more than three sigma. There's a supernova going off tomorrow. Um, we build a dedicated detector I, uh, uh, trigger. I will see it in my, uh, in my experiment. So that's actually quite, uh, quite interesting. And we can uh, do essentially a calorimetric measurement of the total energy that goes into neutrinos, which is interesting if you're interested in, in supernovae. OK. Um, outlook. What, what, what do we do beyond that? Um, first thing I want to tell you about is a larger version of the same thing. Just scale it up. It's called a, in the US, the OE's parlance would be a generation three detector. The Europeans call this the Darwin detector, which is just to push the, uh, to the ultimate sensitivity with some 50 tons of liquid xenon. The observation here is here, and we had this discussion. We are a factor 1,000 away from this neutrino floor. It's not a background by far uh, that is relevant. Uh, the funded experiments that we have seen on Anton and LC um, are still a factor an order of magnitude short of the signal. Um, and so what we really need is um, uh, beyond what is funded, we need a, a bigger detector to fill this WIMP gap, right? We have some very well motivated parameter space, and again, this is assuming that all the dark matter is WIMPs, and maybe you know it's just 10% of the dark matter is WIMPs. So um, I think there's a very strong scientific case to make uh, to uh, go down here. Uh, we can totally do that with a detector. Here's a full simulation taking all backgrounds into account, very realistic with a 50 ton detector, 10 years measuring time. We, we can do it. Um, the point is, it's. I mean, there's a bit of R&D to do, obviously. This is uh, some eight to 10 years away. But it's, the point to make is that this is not a new detector concept that you need to invent to probe that, but it's just a scale up of existing technology. Uh, what is also nice if you are, but I don't think you have nuclear, so much nuclear physics here, if you are interested in neutrinoless double beta decay or the nature of neutrinos, uh, you can use a natural xenon target to look for this decay, neutrinoless double beta decay of xenon 136. You look for a peak above the, the spectrum. Uh, energy resolution is key for this, but we can do that with a natural target that we have already shown now in xenon one ton that we have the best re energy resolution of any uh, liquid xenon uh, experiment, even better than EXO, with quite some sensitivity to probe the inverted mass hierarchy, if that's something that's interesting to you. Uh, this channel is, so one background, yes. So the neutri two neutrino double beta decay is a background to the search to the dark matter search, yeah. But of course, the dark matter search, look at the mass range, this is 2 keV. My dark matter search is uh, somewhere over there in the 2 keV range. But yes, uh, two neutrino double beta decay is a background. Yeah, that's right. But uh, this, this background is taken into account here. Uh, somewhere it should be, I mean, it includes all backgrounds. This is, this is taken into account here. Good, finally, I want to just show you a little experiment that I'm, I'm working on myself at Purdue to with us, uh, together with some colleagues. Uh, introducing to the Albica search, um, where we are exploiting a quite crazy sensitivity of those experiments. If you have this massive detector, and for whatever reason there's some process that ejects just a single electron from its atomic shell, we will drift this electron up, we will extract it, and we will get a signal of the order of 20 to 30 photoelectrons. This is the signal that we get from a single electron that has been left out of its shell. It's a huge signal, you cannot miss that signal. So that's a fantastic sensitivity when you think about that you have targets of tons and you have this sensitivity. It's amazing what you could do with it. Um, of course, the problem is any background process that ejects just a single electron from its shell will also show up. 
And so uh, historically, we haven't really tackled those backgrounds. So what we are working on in some dedicated detectors, this is here at Purdue, a grad student with two undergrads, um, to build dedicated det uh, detectors to learn about those backgrounds, tackle them, get rid of them, and then eventually to probe dark matter using this fantastic capability. Um, some backgrounds, uh, um, I'm running out of time, is coming from photoionization or from delayed extraction. Um, and so uh, what we do together with colleagues from both the Xenon and the LC collaboration and some theorists, in particular also solid state physicists, because we need somebody that can help us to calculate electron levels in liquid xenon. I, I wouldn't know how to do that. Um, so we, we went together building dedicated experiments um, to, to really probe dark matter. What is the reach of that is quite amazing because now you have much lower energy signals. You can go to much lower masses. Here, for example, um, this is existing limits with just a very small detector, you know, one kilogram year exposure. So we're talking about a detector that size that easily fits in anybody of your offices. Uh, and a year of exposure, or you know, two kilograms, half a year, whatever your scales. You have potential to cover some four orders of magnitude if your backgrounds are, are under control. Uh, probe thermal relic particles here uh, in this in, over an incredibly large mass range with a really very small, same thing here. Again, we are in MeV masses. Um, so going down orders of magnitude, these are models where you predict dark matter could be, and we have quite some sensitivity to do that. Um, with very small scale uh, experiments, a very cheap experiment, so that's actually quite exciting. So I conclude. Um, I, as, I think as a community, we need to get our language straight. Dark matter has been discovered. Uh, that's not the question. The question is, what's it made out of? Uh, liquid xenon TPCs are really excellent for a lot of channels, of course for WIMPs, but more generically for thermal relic particles, uh, sub-GV dark matter. We can do su solar and supernova neutrinos, and we can even search for neutrinoless double beta decay. Uh, axions I didn't talk to, but we are sensitive to those couplings as well. Um, xenon one-ton results are really imminent. Sorry that uh, we are like maybe two weeks uh, too late, uh, too early with this talk to show you, but stay tuned. Um, xenon n-ton will start next year. That is much better. We need, however, a 50 ton generation three detector to really probe that down to the atmospheric neutrino background or signal, depending on how you look at it. Um, so that is, is something that the community needs to get together behind of. But at the same time, with, uh, with new ideas in those experiments like Elbika, uh, we can get the, the discovery style uh, uh, physics uh, back into a university lab and just uh, work on that in, well, with a couple of grad students, you put this detector together. So it's actually quite exciting, I think, to expand our reach. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me here. <laughs> ah, ha, <laughs> yes. Uh, we, we had, for, so, <laughs> yeah, so we had forgotten about that when we made this. This, this uh, part is for a proposal that we put uh, this fall in front of the agencies, and we had forgotten about that. Uh, it's actually, we, we will measure it. With that exposure, we will measure it. The point is that, because you average overall scattering angles, your uh, recoil spectrum is a falling exponential, I mentioned that. Um, and at low masses, that exponential becomes extremely steep. So by really going to extremely low energies, I get a huge rate. It's just like I get all the A squared enhancement that I have. And so a kilogram year exposure is enough to measure it. Yep. Okay, but then how does that affect? Uh, it doesn't affect it very much. It just, all it means is that you have a blob on this, uh, on this plot um, where you can't go deeper. But for all the other masses, you can you can go further. Yeah. Uh, okay, the 0.3 GV. So the density of dark matter in this room. How well is that known? Um, if you look at papers that measure it, the the error bars that are quoted by those papers is I would say 10% at most. Uh, some papers are even even much less than that. But different papers differ by more than the stated error bars. So, um, so cautiously, I would say to, I mean, certainly best, better than 0.1 GV. So it's, it's I, I mean, flip, what do you say? I, I would say, um, uh, 0.1, that's what I said, 0.1. No, no, but that's what I say. So I would say 0.3 plus or minus 0.1 GV, I think you really have it covered. Uh, no, yeah, star, stars and, um, so you, uh, it's a, that's actually a good question. Sorry, the other one was a good question too. But um, so you can ask, how do I measure the rotation curve out here, where I don't see stars anymore? Uh, and that actually you do with H alpha uh, um, uh, H1 uh, Doppler effect on that. For the Milky Way galaxy, that's right where we are. Um, that is stars both inside and outside. And uh, for technical reasons, the arrow bars outside are much larger than those inside. So then you have questions, which arm are you looking in? So yeah, that's, I think that's ex what explains why the spread of the measurements is larger than the stated error bars.
Oh, yeah. Sure. Sure. Uh, and just for the protocol, I told you at the very beginning of my talk, don't bash me for doing just a vanilla introduction here, right? But yes, I mean, all those, all those statements are very, very correct, of course. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's correct. Yeah, no, I think we should, we will have to get together for this experiment. Um, so the Europeans are moving very strong on that. The Darwin project has, uh, the consortium has formed the Darwin collaboration uh, last fall. And they have a total of, I think, 8 million euros already in dedicated R&D funding towards this project. Um, you cannot, um, so the total cost is dominated by the Xenon, which is, as targets go, is actually comparatively cheap. It's one of the cheapest targets, but it's still order of a million dollars per ton. So a 50 ton experiment minus the 20 tons that we already have in hand for xenon. I mean, that's a nice thing, right? You can recycle it. It's not, a, it's not an expense, it's just an investment. Um, so you need about 30 million euros for the xenon, then you need another 20 million euros for the PMTs. Um, around, around about $100 million. You know, when if half of that is actually, or the way it goes, probably two thirds of that covered by the Europeans, it's actually not expensive as, as particle physics experiments go. And this is an experiment that will last for easily 10 years, so think about all the grad students coming out of it. Yeah, you can sell it afterwards. Yep, yeah, that's right. No, 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 it's, it's, actually, it's actually crucial. Yeah, yeah. Are there any circumstances where you would be able to see an annual modulation? Ah, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question is for annual modulations. Didn't talk about that for the time. Uh, yes, totally. So what is happening is you know, the sun is going around the galaxy, but then Earth is going around the sun. And so um, uh, the sun going around the galaxy is about 230 kilometers per second. But then the Earth going around the sun is an additional, in this like, uh, the, uh, uh, scale of product, uh, is an additional 30 or so kilometers per second on top of that. And so what you can see is that you would expect when both go through the Milky Way the same rate, then you would expect of order of 30 over 230, so about 10% more scatters. Whereas in winter, when it, so that happens in summer, whereas in winter, uh, where, the, where the two velocity vectors co-align, uh, anti-align, you would see about you know, 5 or 10% uh, less scattering rate. Yeah, that's called the annual modulation search. That's totally a possibility. Uh, of course, uh, a necessary requirement to do an uh, annual modulation search is that you need to have a signal. Yeah. <laughs> um, and because you're looking for a 10% event, you actually need to have a sizable signal. Now, what we do do is, um, what we do do is we do a, an annual modulation search based on our background, because there we have a uh, signal. I told you there's a, a plot of everything. So, and maybe you have heard of the Dama search. I don't know. Yeah. So they claim a dark matter signal is complete nonsense, and it's not a scientific. <laughs> no, it's not a scientific experiment. Like a sci uh, it's 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 really it's crackpot. It's a level of crackpot. And the reason I'm saying that, and I'm standing here, and I don't mind that it's videotaped, is because the community asks those people questions, even through papers in the archive, very simple questions such as, "What's your background?" or "Can you show me what average what your average rate is?" And those questions are not being answered. And so, you know, at that level, I say that's not a scientific discussion. That's, that's crackpot level. But anyway, let's go to this crackpot level. What they find is they find an annual modulation that is that big, which in some weird units is uh, 10 or 20, uh, uh, an amplitude of 10 above, on top of a background of 1,000 in those units. Here's what we measured in Xenon 100. Our overall background is only 5. Their overall background is 1,000. And they see a modulation of a level of, uh, uh, what's, what's the amplitude? I forgot, 15. So our total background is smaller than their ampli uh, modulation amplitude. Now, they use sodium iodine, we use xenon, but sodium iodine, you know, the sodium and the iodine will take the noble gas configuration of the electron shell, which for iodine is that of xenon. It's just on other sides of the periodic table. So actually, the scattering kinematics is all this exactly the same, and we can totally rule that out. So for example, if you have axial vector dark matter, mirror dark matter, luminous dark matter, it doesn't matter. It's all ruled out. These are the signals that you would have expected in our detector. After all efficiency are taken into account, this is a measurement that we actually see, and you find that you know, it's ruled out at very high confidence. Um, but yes, uh, other than that, you can look for annual modulations. Um, here's the power spectrum that you observe, and you find that uh, uh, within the significance two sigma global, you, you don't see anything at one year, and not at other, neither at other times. Yep. Good question. That was a long answer. Sorry. I can I can give shorter answers as well. <laughs> well, thank you very much again. <laughs> <laughs>